Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Chit Heads. I'm Jacob Kyle. My guest today is Christopher Tompkins. Christopher Tompkins is a yoga practitioner and Sanskrit scholar specializing in the tradition of tantric Shaivism. His research focuses in particular on the ritualized practices of Hatha yoga as originally presented in the earliest surviving untranslated tantras, which predate the later Hatha yoga manuals by centuries. He holds advanced degrees in religion and Sanskrit, and he presents internationally on the history, the practice, and the philosophy of yoga. In 2012, he founded the Kashmir Shaivism Preservation Project, which seeks to preserve and to freely share the literary uh, legacy of Kashmir Shaivism. To date, he has acquired over 24,000 pages of manuscripts, most of which have never been seen in the West, that span the vast subject range of philosophy, ritual, and yoga representing the medieval tantric tradition. So with that, uh, hello, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jacob. It's an honor to be with you. So I wanted to start out this interview just by uh, talking a little bit about you and your personal history and maybe the events and the, and, uh, the narrative of your life that led you to this deep scholarly work with uh, Tantric Shaivism, and, and not just scholarly, but also you're a practitioner as well. So I would, I would love to hear what kind of led you to this work. Well, my father got me interested in yoga early on. I guess I was about... Uh, 12 or 13 years old when I first learned meditation from him Mm. in the lineage of Paramahamsa Yogananda, who taught a very uh, powerful form of mantra-based pranayama known uh, colloquially as um, Kriya Yoga. And that practice, in terms of how it affected me, uh, evolved over time and became very powerful in my own life in terms of... um, really the, the tangible effects and healing healing uh, results of, of doing a daily practice of Kriya Yoga. But in terms of my father, I watched this practice help him heal from what was ostensibly a terminal bone marrow cancer. Hmm. And he did finally uh, leave his body some 12 years ago while in a state of full remission, having been the one of the first people on record to have gone into remission with this cancer without any major, um, without the whole major dose of chemotherapy. Wow. So uh, one of his last wishes or requests for me was to find uh, the missing parts of the practice since it had really been handed down from an oral tradition in Yogananda's lineage. And as a Sanskrit scholar, by the time he left his body, um, I began to, you know, really take this request in earnest upon myself. And uh, as you already mentioned, I've been to Kashmir and have been collecting manuscripts for decades, and I'm really interested in, in uh, uh, unearthing the treasures of the original, let us say, vinyasa or practices of this mantra-based and what would turn into a movement-based uh, yoga sadhana. Mm, mm. Wow, that's such a powerful story to have, to have your father really, at, on his deathbed, send you on this journey. I mean, that must have been very mobilizing in, in, a, in a, a very deep way. To well, this day, it's, it's just as inspiring and, and mobilizing. Wow, that's yeah. beautiful. Hmm. So for those that uh, might have, you know, one of these kind of folk ideas about Tantra in their minds, why don't you unpack uh, Tantra a little bit and explain, you know, why it's not about sex or, 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 or maybe how we came to think of Tantra in our, in our folk imagination as having to do with sex and, and, and how what you're studying really differs from this more colloquial understanding. Yes, around the 4th century into the 5th century AD, a movement arose in the Indian subcontinent and spread pretty much like wildfire within 150 years, all throughout, gradually all throughout the South Asian continent through, uh, through Nepal, Tibet, and of course all over India itself, and then into Southeast Asia. And it is a tradition we very, very broadly, and perhaps, uh, as you already indicated, uh, or connoted um, indirectly, uh, we've received this tradition in a way that's been twisted from the original meaning. And this tradition, encapsulated in the word tantra, uh, with its major, major lineage variations, such as mm-hmm. the original Hindu version of Shiva Shakti Tantra, the Buddhist or Vajrayana tradition, and also the Vaishnava or Vishnu 
worshiping sects. And I say that very, very carefully, that word. I want to spell it S E C T S, uh, not S E X. Mm, In the sense yeah. that what essentially this movement is based on is a ritual renovation of the daily yoga sadhana that, or let's say it is not the scratch that, it is the uh, capitulation into a daily ritual of the rather unorganized practices of yoga that had come before it first gathered or uh, put into a, a single text by this legendary sage Patanjali he wrote the Yoga Sutra probably around the third century of the common era. After that, when Tantra begins to take these core practices, the what is let's say the um, six or eight limbs of Patanjali's yoga system, and then to render them into a ritual, a daily ritual to that guaranteed right from the earliest tantras, uh, spiritual liberation at the end of one's current lifetime, which had been unheard of in any yoga school prior to the fourth century. It, you know, for instance, in ancient Buddhism, it would take lifetimes and lifetimes of sort of um, dissolving your karma and reaching the liberated state. But now we have this innovative yoga ritual, an initiation-based ritual, uh, that began to prop up all over India with the novel feature that is not particularly there before, which is namely adding the power of sound meditation in the form of mantra. Mm. Mantra to pranayama, mantra to uh, develop this more worldly, householder-oriented view of yoga, which was also a novel innovation of the tantrics. Within a couple hundred years, by the 7th, 8th centuries, we have all classes of society uh, are now eligible for initiation. It is absolutely a householder or, let us say, non-renunciant-based initiation into this daily yoga ritual. Uh, that's to say, the reason why it exploded, you know, all over the South Asia is because, principally, yoga for the first time had become uh, a, a this-worldly yeah. enterprise in terms of a spiritual practice. Right. How do I cultivate a spiritual practice of yoga in which I can dissolve the shackles of my own ignorance and the uh, suffering that is inherently promulgated by just daily living and belief systems and contracted ways of thinking, how that I can have a practice that can lead to essentially liberation from suffering and yet keep my day job, if you don't mind the yeah. phrase. I mean, and this is also a practice open to women, to all, again, all classes of society, even outcasts. And so that is partially responsible for its explosion. Um, in terms of the sexual side of things, what you have, of course, and you can imagine in a tradition that we should give dates here uh, that spans almost exactly a thousand years. I mean, Tantra and its different lineages dominates the overall religious um, uh, presence of, of Hinduism in India and of Buddhism beyond. Um, and this tradition, because it is public, because it is uh, householder based because it is open to all folks tradition that has women gurus by the way as well as male by the ninth century particularly in Kashmir um, when you have this a tradition like this there's a certain sense of openness that the yoga which in the early tantras is pretty much limited uh, to this mantra-based innovation of choreographed practices where pranayama, mantra, um, also preparation of a sacred space, a householder mandala to practice in every day. Um, this branches out into what other ways can we experience yoga? How do we experience yoga? Do we experience yoga when we're smelling a rose or watching a beautiful sunset or making love? Mm -hmm. And so you have some of these more goddess-oriented lineages of Tantra by the ninth century that are exploring different ways one could simulate. In other words, experiencing a sensual um, powerful moment, but not in passing, engaging pranayama, engaging meditation on that rose or that sunset or that orgasm or that taste of something delicious. So you have, in other words, um, the opportunity to experience yoga 
in today's language, we would say on and off the mat. So not just in your daily morning ritual, but even throughout the day. And this comes with this novel idea that not only can you experience liberation through death through these practices, but even while still living in a body. This is called jivan mukti, meaning embodied liberation, which becomes a major appealing philosophy by the ninth century. All of this is to say is that by the time the tantric movement dies out pretty much overnight uh, due to foreign invasion, first of Islamic regimes and then the British Raj, you know, beginning, I think, really in effect by the 14th, 15th centuries AD. Um, by the time the British, let us say, in the 19th century really begin to look at Hinduism and and the um, different religious movements of, of India, Tantra had been gone for centuries, but it still lingered in the dim memories of, of, um, of the people of India. And so what also lingers is some of the, the really avant-garde uh, memories of what Tantra had turned into that espoused, for example, the possibility of having yogic liberation through a sensual experience such as, and certainly not limited to, sexual experience. Right. There were sexual rituals. None of them have been translated. None of the passages from the Tantras that have any sexual rituals have really been translated or dis disseminated to the West. What we do have then is, in, this is my theory, is by the 19th century, rumors of, you know, of these practices that had been, again, forgotten over time. And the word Tantra then becomes uh, devolved, in my opinion, to something that has to do with taboo practices that are no longer mainstream in India. You might even say India was a much more liberal society in terms of the tantric movement uh, than it had been for the, or it was more liberal in its outlook on yoga practice through the 16th century, 15th, 16th centuries, and then became uber conservative under Islamic and British rule. And so Tantra then becomes devalued into something, you know, that is a bit on the fringes of society, very esoteric and very threatening, I would say, to particularly some of the more conservative Christian values back in England during British occupation. So we have evidence, last point here. We have evidence, for example, of several very conservative British authority figures, one judge in particular comes to mind, who said, yeah, these Hindus can get so bad, you know, in terms of what they practice, they even once had this thing called Tantra in which people worshipped women, I mean, as goddesses and had crazy sex, and it's just full of, you know, demonic influence. This is we have letters to this effect by one British judge. And somehow, I, I, my crazy theory is that somehow the idea that Tantra equals spiritual sex was actually a liberal backlash or response to this British misinterpretation of Tantra. Wow. That's my theory. The key point is this, uh, Jacob. There's the tantric tradition is not an oral transition. Or sorry, not an oral tradition. Really, it is based on the actual tantra. A tantra, by definition, is a divine revelation from some you know deity figure or a conduit of a deity, like a sage. It's much like the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, uh, that are divinely revealed. You know, from God to Moses. So if you don't have the Tantra that gives the ritual, then you don't really have the authority, uh, technically speaking, to be teaching those rituals. And that is precisely why Tantra was squashed overnight, because they, you know, removed the uh, legality of, of practicing these rituals and eliminated the Tantras, which went underground and survived today only in manuscripts. And that's what we're trying to revive. Right. And it's been, I mean, it's relatively recently, yes, that these, that these manuscripts have begun to be investigated. Can you give yes. like a timeline of when they started to be, you know, brought to the surface? Yes, certainly. Uh, only in the 20th century. We have, for example, one of the most famous of the efforts to revive any of this material is that of Arthur Avalon, a.k.a. John Woodruff, who was one of the um, 
sympathetic British figures who also was one of the earliest Sanskritists who was interested in the richness and history of the culture. And so he, for example, translated a very late text, 17th century uh, text that in, in and of itself, the um, system of six chakras, it's called in English, the Shat Chakra Nirupana, uh, attempts to sort of remember the chakra system and, and all of its various um, uh, various tenets. Um, and with that, we have gradually over the decades, and particularly in the last three decades since Arthur Avalon first published his translation of that text, I think in um, 1917, we have now uh, an international effort to collect manuscripts in libraries, to type them in, meaning to say they make them searchable on computers. Mm. And scholars like myself and a number of others, mostly European scholars, <laughs> hasn't been affected America too much yet. Um, you know, we share these texts. There's a couple of websites in which you can download uh, manuscripts that have been typed in or manuscripts in their rare, their raw form. And so our knowledge is exponentially growing. But I think we're really still in a in a very uh, infantile stage in our scholarship, and there's going to have to be a lot of unlearning in terms of comparing what's in these texts to what is supposedly in them, if you follow me. Yes, yes. And actually, that's a, I'm glad you said that, because that's a perfect segue into um, one of my next questions. Because, um, And thank you for that incredible historical overview. That was really very fascinating, and I think people are going to get a lot out of that. Um, but now I want to shift to just what you're saying, which is, um, in your work, you know, I, I've, t I've taken one of your courses, downloaded one of your online courses, and you, and you go to great efforts to demystify uh, the chakras uh, by disentangling their original meaning from the modern uh, westernized understanding, which in your course you, um, you teach as originating with Arthur Avalon's work, which as you're implying now, it seems that he just, he just, you know, he was a victim of his time and that he wasn't exposed to the text that he would need to have been exposed to in order to make a correct interpretation. So can you tell us the story of how the chakras became reimagined in the psychological way that they're understood today? Uh, sure. Uh, we, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty of it is that chakras, whether called that or not, you know, there's different adjectives, lotuses, or even, even the Sanskrit word, stana, T H long A N A stana means locale in the subtle body. These are target centers in the subtle body envisioned as lotuses that open and close as you inhale they open all together uh, and then as you exhale they close they are uh, the whole image of the subtle body is a very floral one in the early tantras the earliest uh, let us say bona fide uh, teaching on what we would later call the chakras shows up in the, for example, the Kalotra Tantra, the Kalotra, which means the beyond time or the timeless Tantra. This, this text is, you know, 5th, 6th century AD. Avalon's uh, much later sort of attempt to remember, or sorry, Avalon's text called the System of Six Chakras, that was written 1,200 years later, an attempt to remember the science, which was much older. Yeah. Science is essentially, uh, in terms of the subtle body, target areas that are visualized as you apply the practice of pranayama and particular seed sounds or syllables that have no meaning in and of themselves, but these seed syllables representing collectively the elements of the body and of the universe, earth, water, fire, air, and space, um, are in and of themselves alive with power. Uh, they are targeted in an ascending way throughout the central channel or the Shushumna at these lotuses or centers. These chakra could mean center as well as wheel. And the sense of it is that when one targets one of these mantras, they are able, as they are choreographed to a pranayama practice, they are able to dislodge or pierce through stuck karmic energy in the body that is responsible for the state of, let's say, unawakened consciousness, mm. the state of 
of contracted awareness that has us thinking that we are just mortal human beings doomed to die and, you know, uh, that can't particularly have any lasting happiness, perhaps, in life. Mm. Um, the, the idea is that once these blockages or grunties or knots, the thickness at the base of each chakra or each lotus uh, is that part of the stem that holds up the petals of each lotus. When you pierce these points in the ancient tantras by drawing these mantras up the central channel, you literally dislodge or even perhaps psychologically speaking, unlearn contracted states of awareness until what is revealed is that your true essence, your soul, that which is the one who is looking, you know, you're looking for the one who is looking. Mm. And all that is left once these blockages are removed is what is there, and that is your inherent immortal self. And then if that, if that is realized while in a body, then you experience that state we're talking about called jivan mukti, mm -hmm. you know, embodied liberation. So these sounds that are used to target these chakras are really the key essence. The chakras themselves, incidentally, have different schematics throughout the tantras. There's six chakra systems, five chakras, 12 chakras in, in one particular text that I did a course on mm -hmm. called the Universal Mother Chakra System. Mm -hmm. um, how can we have different chakra systems? Well, the answer is quite simple. Before the tantric movement died out, there was no fixed chakra system because those are simply visual props to help you guide sounds through the central channel. Mm -hmm. So my lineage might be different from yours. In my lineage, we may uh, accent, for example, the navel chakra as the lower range of the breath, uh, the breath cycle. Um, in other tantras, the heart is key. Uh, in others, in the very last text of the tantric movement, we even have a lotus or a chakra drop to the base of the spine. Muladhara chakra was almost always in the navel, and at the very end, it gets dropped to the base of the spine. Um, for, for example, principally when the science of pranayama is withdrawn from the chakras. Well, you can't inhale all the way down to your perineum, you know, so there, that chakra wouldn't have been there when the yoga was intact, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the seed mantras are very key, and what powers them, or their power, this is kind of an oxymoron, but their power is the shakti. In other words, these mantras are not let us say, forms or methods of worshiping some deity, they, they are considered to be the deity. Shakti is the syllable long for earth or ving for water. And each of the five elemental syllables each have a different vowel to accent a particular nodal point in the subtle body. Mm. Wow, that's you know I I, <clears throat> I I really like this idea of the the goddess as the mantra, and it's it's really very radical, at least in the in the way that we think about language generally as being you know a form of representation. You know, we don't really think of of vibration or or our oral capacity as having a, a material impact on the world. So, can you kind of explain, you know? Can you get, can you go deeper into that and sort of explain kind of the philosophy behind vibration and why and what you and what you mean maybe a little bit more about the goddess as the mantra? Right. So when we're talking about we say goddess, it's best to break uh, certain words down to their simplistic meaning, and it's even perhaps. It's a bit daring to say, but I would even say some words are better not translated into English very often. Uh, for example, when I say goddess, in terms of correlating that to seed mantras, that word goddess, the feminine, uh, anything in the Sanskrit language, which is, of course, gendered, much like French is and other European languages, all terms, all words, all nouns that have to do with movement, procreative essence, that have to do with uh, the flow of anything are typically, not always, but typically feminine nouns. And the word for energy then, you know, that which is the power of consciousness to become or to manifest form and to throw it off again, to manifest my body and to dissolve it again with each breath I take, um, the power is the feminine. So 
So the masculine and feminine, masculine meaning that which is static, stable, permanent, enduring, like the sun would be the masculine and the rays, the heat or the light rays, the sun rays are the feminine. And that the word that encapsulates all of that, often used by its connotative word goddess, is the word, the feminine noun shakti, which means simply energy or power. And so when I'm chanting these seed syllables, these sounds, we're dealing with feminine energy because sound is vibrational. Sound is uh, that which moves. And the sound current, just as we might think of you generating a sound, you could shatter glass. In the same way, uh, certain combinations of letters that form these seed mantras have the scientific effect in the subtle body of shattering or breaking through blockages, much in the way you might say, uh, somebody practicing yogasana might be moving through a sequence of poses on the mat and say they go a little deeper into you know, a hip opener and suddenly, as many students will attest, there might be a flood of release, like a sense of something just released in my body. You might feel emotional in a certain pose and your mind isn't even thinking of any life situation that would make you emotional. And that's because, according to the tantras, you are freeing up or you have dislodged karmic gunk, something perhaps that we would call the source of a disease in the body has been sprung. So the energy then, if it is doing this in terms of the more powerful variation, the subtle body of moving these sounds through the central channel to break such blockages to your own awakening, um, because they are so powerful and so effective, they are literally divinized, these shaktis, these movement, these sound movements of energy currents are divinized by the word goddess. And so it's not the other way around where I'm worshiping Lakshmi or Saraswati or some Hindu goddess as the mantra. Rather, uh, those mantras are first the, uh, you know, the healing power I'm enacting in my yoga, so powerful that I divinize them with the name mother or matrika, which means little mothers. So we have this word cognate with you know, the Latin root of mother, mater, or madre, let us say. Mm. Uh, matrika, these little mothers that take you home to yourself and your own heart, the heart of awakening. Wow. So it's really, it's really the power that, and the energy, the quality of the energy, the, vib- the, the frequency of the energy that's primary, and then we, we divinize with these images, you know, not to insinuate that they are literally personifications, you know, in the sky moving around, but that right. that's, this is, a, this is a, a tool of imagination in order for us to, to have a relationship with that quality. Is that essentially right. the idea? Yeah, so the visualizing of the deity or the image of the deity in the tantras is incredibly secondary. It's much more minor, uh, according to these teachings, than the sound representation. Mm. So you don't want to get stuck on the image of the deity as a visual. The tantrics actually, I should say, very lightly make fun of mainstream religion in India that is too hung up on the visual because, you know, they have this whole yoga sound science. That's precisely right. Okay. The, okay. So now I, I want to go. I want to talk a little bit more. <clears throat> You've done a, a really great job at explaining sort of what the original uh, chakras were were meant to be and, and their meaning. But I would like to kind of go back a little bit to uh, the the modern understanding of the chakras, and maybe we could just talk about that. In and maybe you could do kind of a compare and contrast, or explain what 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 we is it that we've inherited. You talk about Jungian's uh, Jung's influence in your in your in your um, in your course. Um, what is the influence of Jung, and then what have we inherited that still resonant with that old system, and what have we inherited that is completely modern? Okay, that's uh, that's always a fun conversation. Yeah. Young, one of the greatest minds and psychologists in world history, in my opinion, uh, and a great innovator, thinker, very open to new ideas and cultures and the collective unconscious, uh, first encountered Arthur Avalon's translation of the Shut Chakra Nirupana, this post-tantric sort of um, 
cliff note version of the chakra system, which does not give the sadhana, does not give the sequencing of practices applied to the chakras, this text. Now, we have this is a critical point, Jacob, because we have to remember that what we have you know, in terms of the, the, the history of our understanding of, of the tantras, what we really have are these post-tantric manuals, such as this text on the six chakras that later become standardized, that system. Uh, we have Hatha Yoga manuals, which are nothing more than sort of bullet point reviews of the practices once engaged in a ritual vinyasa or sequence uh, in the tantras. So in other words, quite, quite plainly, we are left without the practice. We only have the props. We have the nomenclature. We have the, uh, you know, the tools for the practice listed in texts like that. So when a Carl Jung gets a hold of it, keeping in mind this is the first text ever put into a uh, Western language on the chakras. When Carl Jung gets a hold of it in the early 1930s, he's fascinated, but he's very outspoken in saying that we don't know what these people were doing with these chakras. We know, for example, what they look like. We know where they're supposed to be in the body, uh, but we don't have a practice. He acknowledges that. Mm -hmm. But he goes a step further and says, we here in the Christian West, he speaks to us. I think his lectures were, um, I want to say 1932. He does a series of lectures on the chakras from this one text, which becomes to this day, the fundamental basis of our entire understanding in the West of the chakra system. What I'm about to tell you, in my opinion from my research. And that is in saying that, well, you know, we don't really know how these mantras were applied. He never really talks about pranayama. He doesn't, you know, nothing. So he says, instead, it's useful to simply superimpose Western psychology. Mm -hmm. And he does so. He does so in a brilliant way. For example, in the way that is commonly known today, where the chakras are seen as emotional uh, centers of emotional identification that have to do with different states of consciousness in one's everyday life, such as, you know, the second chakra is near the genitals, so this must be, you know, a center where you meditate on sexual issues. Um, uh, Manipura chakra, the third chakra in that system, um, has to do with the element of fire and the image of the animal vehicle is the ram. So this must have to do with um, our fight or flight, you know, the sense of, of he, he describes, actually it's Joseph Campbell taking the teachings of Jung, talks about how the first three chakras through Jung's system now are animal instinct, self-preservation, muladhara chakra, you know, coming back to your root, sexual chakra, and then uh, power chakra. Well, he says this is what animals experience too, fight, flight, sexual procreativity, and also territorialism. Mm -hmm. So these kind of psychological identifications are not original to the text. This is what was superimposed, and quite brilliantly, you know, and quite innovatively by Carl Jung, uh, onto the chakra system as he understood it. The problem is, as beautiful as the system is, I think we've gone too far the other way, where most people don't even know that this comes from Carl Jung anymore, mm -hmm. much less, you know, look at his own writings on it, which tells us quite literally and quite directly, as I reveal in my course, he says, we can't even begin to understand what these people were doing with these chakras. So here, let me give you this psychological nuance on it so we find uh, more information. Hmm. And we're still stuck in that. And, you know, it's, again, a useful system. I used to teach the Jungian psychology of the chakras. But now you have people offering teacher trainings and charging exorbitant prices to become, like, some kind of master of the chakras. And you're really becoming a master of Jungian psychology. Yeah. I mean, for example, there's no such thing as a closed chakra. This does not exist in any text. Chakras are lotuses that, as I mentioned, open literally 21,600 times a day, which is the average number of rounds of respiration in the adult human being. Mm. And they open as you inhale, they close as you exhale, this dynamic movement. Well, 
that doesn't really sync up with a workshop on chakras on how to open up your sexual center or something yeah. like that. It yeah. just doesn't match. So I'm hoping to come to a place of harmonization where we don't throw the Jungian system away, but it should not be an impediment to discovering the truth any longer, which is what was the practice applied to these chakras originally? Yeah. 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 And I think that, and, and, and what I hear you saying a little bit uh, as when you acknowledge kind of the brilliance of the innovation is that it, it seems like you're saying that it's not so much that this is not a fruitful system, you know, in certain instances, but that we need to, we need to acknowledge that just because it's, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily ancient. It's certainly not within the original text, but it still can be useful. There are still people who, who may, yeah. you know, you know, gain, you know, certain experiences or have certain realizations through that work, but let's not be confused about its, its tradition. And, and, um, and so I, and so I hear you kind of, uh, not necessarily throwing out the, the modern system, but rather really, uh, focusing on, on really un, un, unveiling the truth of what the tradition is all about. And what it's about is far simpler. This is the good news, Jacob, in my opinion. <laughs> it's far simpler than the complex version that we've received. I mean, if you look at anything on the chakras in a yoga studio, it's usually a Saturday workshop that's not really tied into moving postural vinyasa, for example. But I'm working on texts now in which, one of which is uh, one of the sources for Krishnamacharya's uh, revival of this yoga, Krishnamacharya being the father of modern yoga and, and um, guru of Patabi Joy Sayangar, so responsible for almost all of all vinyasa-based yoga. One of his source texts, uh, the name of which I'll be releasing soon when I publish on this, but it gives uh, a sadhana of breath practice and mantra and postures that are to be engaged in a flowing vinyasa that are based on the six chakras. So, the, you know, these people weren't doing workshops on Saturday. The chakras were a part of your daily movement meditation, and it, for scientific reasons, you would visualize that center, honor the deified mantra that you're working with, that... Uh, is meant to break open these blockages, and in this particular text, with the addition of physical movement, so you're not just sitting on the floor meditating in your subtle body. Yeah. But you know, it, it's a streamlined scientific practice, and that's what we've lost. Yeah, uh, that's so. That's I'm really glad that you said that because um, this idea that you know you can go to one workshop on a Saturday and you know clear your heart chakra is right. is something that you know even I, I was having another interview with Anadeya Judith, who really does represent I think the the yeah. Uh, the 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 heritage of of the more Jungian side, but still from like a rigorous vantage point, and she says that that um, that this idea that you can go to one workshop and, and clear the house, so to speak, is is really indicative more of this Western bias towards the quick fix prescription that people just want to you know lay a gemstone on their chakra and yeah. and and then be healed forever, you know? Yeah, and all of these systems, all of these traditions. Uh, in fact, even the text I was referring to, which I'm just calling the Kaula Tantra for now, and I'm going to reveal its name as soon as I publish on it, because it's a hot tamale, let me tell you. It's a 14th century Tantra, but it gives, again, this practice of how to integrate, or how chakras were always integrated with breath, pranayama, particularly mantra. Um, but to actually preserve a sense of that, to first explore it with baby steps, this text says, yeah, and you know what? You can innovate. You can do these poses with that chakra or work in this particular pranayama. There's all these options of like kind of variations of practice with chakras mm -hmm. in this particular tantra. So the spirit of innovation is a good one. Wow. Krishnamacharya obviously kept that going. But I think we are in the dangerous place now in what I like to call the terminal, terminal moraine phase, you know, like the end of the glacier and the rubble of uh, centuries of, of mis, misdissemination of these tantric teachings. We're in a place now where we're too improvisational. Mm -hmm. That's to say, we've gone too far up, far off in the left field. Let me make it up as I go. Land, and this is indicative of, of some of these interpretations of the chakras that I'm seeing out there now. Yeah. So, and then, you know, you go so far from the left field, nobody even wants to look at source texts anymore because they assume that these teachings are in them, and they are not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So one one of the things, one of the disseminations that you you talk about in your course is the incorrect um, translation of the Bija mantras. And in the in the course, you mentioned that the reason for this is that this later text really didn't include the vowels. So I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, that because I think that's so interesting because it's so wildly you know represented. Uh, in so many books and online, these 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 interpretations of the Bija mantras, which you say are wrong, and and you're the first person I've ever heard say that, so it's pretty radical. Yeah, it's radical, but it's it's um in, in a sense I could take a, an exhale here because to explain that is far simpler than what we've already covered. Um, to make it a brief kind of overview, we have two major divisions of tantric texts, I would say, in terms of the yoga, the ritual practices. We have the tantras, which were divinely revealed, meaning to say they're cryptic. The average layperson isn't really able to understand how to form the vinyasa. So you have cryptic verses on, you know, for example, chant that mantra that begins with the letter P and then, you know, uh, sequence that with this level of devotion. So I'm giving pieces of the practice in the tantras. Um, what is required or what was required was the guru to explain the practices to you when you're initiated. Now, we don't have these gurus at least 90% of the time, 99% of the time, we don't have such gurus anymore. So we do have the tantric texts, and we have some of these post-tantric cliff note reviews of the practices like Arthur Avalon's source. There's another class of, of texts, though, namely some of these gurus from the medieval period wrote manuals in which they explain the missing pieces of the practice. Now, where I'm going with this is the, the mantras that are used. I know of no tantra, meaning divine revelation, of which there are hundreds or thousands spanning a, you know, the thousand-year history of tantra, that actually gives you the spelling of the seed mantras you're working with. Mm. Why? Because they are the key to the whole system. Remember I said tantra's innovation is sound. It's mantra. The whole lineage, the, sorry, the whole tradition didn't call itself tantra. It, that was the name of its sacred books. Tantra means something woven with wisdom. Mm -hmm. It called itself the path of sound, mm -hmm. the mantra marga, the path, the yogic path of mantra. And so the last thing it's going to do is just give away the mantras for people who might be uninitiated looking through a tantra. Right. Okay, so where does this get us? Essentially, Arthur Avalon inherited one of the texts that does not give the seed mantras, but simply says, uh, when you work with Muladhara Chakra, you'll work with that, you know, it's kind of like tongue-in-cheek, you'll work with that seed syllable that begins with the letter L and ends with the bindu, which is the seed point in the syllable om, written often as the letter M, M as in Mary, with a dot under it or below it. It does not give the vowel. Same thing with water. We'll say for this chakra, you begin with that, or you work that mantra that begins with the semi-vowel V as in Victor, and ends with the bindu, the M with the dot. It does not give the vowel. In Sanskrit, this is so simple, it's almost um, surprising. In Sanskrit, when a vowel is not given, the default vowel that one assumes is the short letter A. Mm. Uh, so in essence, because our only text up to Avalon's time anyway, gives the mantras without the, the vowel that forms each, he simply inserted the letter A for each of them. And so we incorrectly have uh, lum, vam, rum, uh, yum, and hum. Well, these earlier manuals that have since been revealed and, and some are even published where the gurus of the medieval period, much older, 12th, 13th century, they spell out the mantras. And so they, you know, and they're clearly given. And what the, the vowels are in those seed mantras, beginning with the letters L, V, um, R, Y, and H, respectively, are the long vowels in the Sanskrit language, meaning A, E, U, I, and Ao. This is important because those, those vowel sounds hit a different point in your central channel as you ascend the mantras one after another with your exhale. Now, if they all have just that short letter A as we've inherited them, you know, such as lum, bum, rum, 
um, if you place your hand on your heart, your, your listeners can do this, and just chant them over and over. Where does the energy vibrate? As I chant, long, long, over and over, you will feel the major epicenter of that vowel is right in the solar plexus area, the heart, you know, above the navel. But what if I chant the letter E or Ooh, I gradually you'll find, for example, E resonates in the throat, O resonates in the mouth, I in the upper palate, and so on. There's an ascending movement. The name of the practice that engages these syllables is called Uchara, ascending the goddess. Mm. So why do we have just these seed mantras? It's, it's literally this simple. No scholar has worked enough in depth with any chakra system and, you know, took the energy to look at these ritual manuals, which unpack all of this. I'm, I'm working on it myself, and I've been revealing before I publish what's found in these texts, these manuals. And they're all over the place. I mean, um, the correct seed monsters are so commonly given in these manuals that it's like an open and shut case. We simply have an error a well, by the well-meaning Sanskritist Arthur Avalon in 1917, who uh, superimposed the short vowel A for the vowels of those five seed monsters, and that's why we have those today. They are not correct. Do you think, do you think that he knew that that was problematic? I mean, your, your personal guess— that's a, the, I've thought about that a lot. I can't say. I could tell you that he was a good Sanskritist. The fact that he puts the letter A uh, as as a superimposed vowel because there's no vowel given doesn't make him a bad Sanskritist. It means that he doesn't understand tantric ritual. Mm, right. And there's no reason he should. He was like the pioneer of this. So there was almost no text available. He only, you know, I think... As prolific as he was, his range of texts was only in a couple of dozen. Now we have thousands. Yeah. Wow. You know? Yeah. And so the evidence is all over the place. It just takes the right scholars to really explore, and it's, it's right there, right in your face. Mm. So actually, n you mentioned he didn't understand the rituals. So this is something that I wanted to get into now. And you've mentioned a little bit um, uh, that sadhana, tantric sadhana, included, cl includes mantra and visualization. But could you kind of describe um, what a daily tantric sadhana will look like? Yes, I just did this actually in my course with uh, Shiva Ray. She and I um, started a, a major course called uh, Asana Vinyasa, the history and evolution of asanas. And the first two parts of the course, uh, the first part we have finished is the origins of Surya Namaskara, part one and two. And in part one, which we just did, ended I think the last, well, somewhere in the last two weeks of December, uh, I attempted to share what the daily ritual was like for these householder tantrics. And in short, what you have is a, is a number of very self-empowering, beautiful mini rites, R-I-T-E-S, that form your ritual for daily self-awakening, self-grounding, self-love, that were performed around a very simple or perhaps a very elaborate mandala or practice area in a part of your home that would be reserved for that. And India was often outside because of the weather. Yeah. But always, you know, near your house or your home. I mean, this is literally keep your day job. So you're going to have a ritual that is structured around something that need not take all day. And so you have, for example, one of the initial and most important rituals is called circumambulation, pradakshina, where you bow down at each direction of your mandala, and you have some kind of an altar in the center. It might be what we call a murti or an expression in tangible form of a deity that you are connected with, like Shiva or the goddess or Vishnu or the Buddha. Maybe you have nothing there. Maybe it's, I like to say to my students, put a picture of yourself as a baby there. Mm. You know, we're talking about unlearning all that we've been, all that's been used to mask our true identity through this ritual circumambulation, prostrating at the junctures of the day like dawn, in the practice of postural movement, for example, that would become known later as Surya Namaskara. This is supposed to, you mentioned Mark Singleton's book, Yoga Body. This is all dismissed as a practice that was made up, you know, roughly around 1928 and forward. That's nonsense. Surya Namaskara, dynamic movement meditation, known as yoga, was part of the daily ritual. Mm. 
including 12 poses that you prostrate through in a, in a series of movements that represents death and rebirth. Today, I die unto the self that I was yesterday, and I'm reborn, singing the mantras that guide my movement as a mantric vibration of pure Shakti, and then I go about my day job. And there's little rites within that, such as um, placing little pots of water that have been imbued with the mantras you're working with before you even started, and then you sprinkle that onto the ground, some of the drops of that water, wonderful ritual, for example, of... Uh, blessing uh, a particular flower that that is dear to you, and then tossing it into your practice space before you even begin, with a hum part, this mantric exclamation, which clears all obstacles, and you create a space that's pure of any contracted energy, emotionally, physically, or mentally, and so. Eventually, this ritual will culminate in all lineages with a seated practice before the center of your practice space that choreographs working these seed mantras we were talking about, the core innovation of Tantra, up and down the central channel in a certain Again, choreographed sequence. I'm performing visualization of my of those chakras at the same time that I'm pausing my breath at the end of inhale, generating that fire of Kundalini, which is nothing more than the generation of centralized prana in the in the navel plexus that is fired up with the mantra as I exhale up the central channel. Done in a certain rhythm sequence, five or six seed mantras in several rounds. And towards the end of the tantric movement, the last half, beginning around the ninth century, we begin to see that added to this to affect the power of these mantras to break open the grunties in the central channel, the knots, the blockages, we have the body uh, being engaged in movement and standing uh, poses and inversions and semi-seated poses, a lot of the bird poses we know today, like crown chasana, mm -hmm. are showing up then. In, in other words, if I can get my whole body moving, contracting, coiling in and out my legs into the center to help when I exhale that mantra up the central channel, it'll uh, enhance its effect. All of this, I'm giving a very rough, you know, sort of unorganized review of the daily ritual because it evolves over a thousand years in the tantras it is all but lost to us what is lost to us is not the practices we have these listed in the hatha yoga manuals we have the pranayamas we have the kumbhakas we have bastrika we have ujjayi breath but they're listed much like you would list um ingredients of a recipe mm. but you don't have the vinyasa of how to you know create the dinner uh, literally how to sequence them in due order and choreograph them together. That is in the tantras, and that's what we know the least about at the moment. Mm. So what, uh, uh, in your research, have you found additional postures besides the, I'm, I'm forgetting the number now, in the Hatha Yoga Pratipika, it's, is it? 84, 84. Are, are celebrated, but that text only gives 32. Most are seated, yeah. So have you found in your research that uh, other postures besides the ones listed in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika? Well, I'll put it this way. In Krishnamacharya's uh, biography, not biography, sorry, his first text called the Yoga, Yoga Makaranda, The Sweetness of Yoga, which he wrote in 1934, I believe, uh, probably one of the most colossal oversights in the history of scholarship on yoga is the fact that this man gives us 27, I think, sources that he's drawing from, because we know that he gives, you know, dozens of asanas. Mm -hmm. His students, Batabi Joyce, et cetera, give dozens more that they say they've learned from him. And he claims all of these teachings come from his source list of texts. Um, nobody's really looked at this before. He's been dismissed in two books. One is The Yoga of the Mysore Palace. The other uh, is The Yoga Body. Both texts have footnotes that say this is just padding. There's nothing, there's no asana movement in this. There's no vinyasa in his list of texts. Well, what I'm going to be coming out with this year are publications that will share the fact or show the fact that his list of source text has, I think my last count was 380 asanas, um, and performed in dynamic movement in the daily yoga ritual to which we've been talking about. So, yes. Wow. And many poses, particularly those that form Surya Namaskara, 
did not have the names they have today, mm -hmm. right? right? But you can tell it's the same pose by the description of how the body moves. So the innovation of names of poses is one of the challenges. So if you're a scholar, you've got to go deep. You've got to be disciplined. You can't just search these texts for, you know, downward-facing dog. You're not going to find it. I mean, that's probably a name that Krishnamacharya innovated. Yeah. Uh, but you will find korma, vat, korma pose, the original tortoise pose, as I see it, was you know, the shape of a tortoise shell being in mind for what is later called uh, downward facing dog. Uh, so that's one example. Wow, that's amazing. So in your opinion, and you mentioned Mark Singleton, and I was actually going to ask about him next, um, you know, for the listeners who aren't aware, he wrote this um, big splash of a book called Yoga Body, where he argued that most of the vinyasas were modern and were inspired by Swedish gymnastics. I'm wondering what... Yeah. What you have to say about the Swedish gymnastics claim, do you think any part of it is true, or do you think it's mostly bogus? Almost completely untrue. I wouldn't say bogus in the sense that it's made up. I mean, that's uh, his thesis, and certainly there's some sort of influence one way or the other. I'm not here to talk about that. My area is not in the history of modern yoga. Yeah. But what I can tell you is that the very sources, and these are just some of the sources that have asana vinyasa movement, uh, the very sources that Krishna, Krishna Macharya exclaims were his, uh, the, the foundation of his asana revival, he could consistently in his book says, I'm getting this from the yoga shastras, which turns out to be really the tantras, though that word was no longer usable by right. team three. But, um, uh, is, the long and short of it is that in these texts, as I say, you have the basic dynamic movements that he claims were uh, fabricated by Krishnamacharya under the influence of Swedish gymnastics and superimposed upon an imagined, an imagined yoga tradition. That is completely and uh, it's completely false. Mm. If you look, if you take the time to look at these texts, I think he covers three tantras on one page of his introduction. And, you know, in his, uh, his gesture of dismissing Tantra as a real viable source for asana vinyasa, uh, you know, and, and with that, you have Krishnamacharya's sources dismissed. I now have in my folder, I've identified asana vinyasa practices. I think I have about 88 different Tantras that I've found some form of asana vinyasa practice that is dynamic movement. For example, the sequence of dunda poses or dun poses, you know, which has been rather obsequiously or generically dumbed down to push-up poses. Oh, wow. We see this in his book where it is claimed that a series of calisthenic, you know, push-up poses are called dundas really come from Krishnamacharya's teacher's uh, physical education manual, not from the tantras. And those poses being sort of the heart of Surya Namaskara Vinyasa. Well, they are the heart of Surya Namaskara Vinyasa. I have two puddities or ritual manuals. Uh, one is 15th century, the early, the other is 13th century, which give dunda poses that we now know today as Chaturanga Dandasana and up facing dog, down facing dog, you name it, all sorts of variations given that are called dandavats or dunda poses in these medieval texts. So it is a completely incorrect thesis uh, on that score. Wow. And uh, I mean, there's a couple of things that seem, you know, maybe symptomatic or, or one of the symptoms that that led to this this problematic thesis is that is one is the the lack of general scholarship on the Tantras up until, you know, that's the key problem. Yeah, the key pro one of the key problems. And then also what seems to be problematic is that it essentially claims that Krishnamacharya was a liar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really the default. And I think Singleton and others, I mean, Singleton was gracious enough to, you know, uh, at least extol Krishnamacharya as an innovator. Now, that's true. He was an innovator. I mean, where I sharply diverge from that thesis, of course, is, or that conclusion, is that he was innovating probably 25% of the material of which all of it, at least ostensibly, with some innovative poses, but most of it was uh, drawn directly from the, the source tantras, certainly from at least two of the tantras in his list are overwhelmingly obviously his sources. Yeah. Um, so 
but in the mainstream, the, the negative effect of this, Jacob, is that non-scholars, yogis who are scholarly in their approach but do not read Sanskrit, is what I mean by that, yeah. um, are taking the kind of thunder of Singleton's book and then saying basically he's a liar, Christian Machari, as you said. You see this in blogs everywhere. Yeah. Now, it's quite disturbing because the man died, I think, in around 1998, 99, at the age of 99. And, uh, not, you know, not seven, eight years after his death, the... Um, Yoga the Mysore Palace book came out and basically, uh, you know, basically gave us this kind of disclaimer of what I would call defamation of his very lineage. His, uh, sorry, his very um, heritage. Wow. Well, then it's I mean, it's it's amazing that you're coming out with this book then. Do you do you have a title for this work yet? And do you know around when uh, you'll be publishing it? Yeah, this is one of the problems with being a stickler for truth. You tend to take forever to publish. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, uh, the Sanskrit is something that I've been trying to master in these texts, not just the language, but the the sort of coded language for all uh, these practices for, for over a decade now. So I'm actually publishing a PhD, hopefully in the next year. But right now I'm writing my PhD finally, which is going to be, I'm not giving you a title because I don't have it yet, but it's essentially the integrity of tantric yoga, which is Hatha yoga, mm -hmm. of course. And in that I'm already beginning now with an article that is due out Definitely by the end of January. My goal is by January 25th, which is the integrity of Surya Namaskara in Source Tantras. And so that will immediately debunk some of these wild theories made particularly in Yoga of the Mysore Palace and Yoga Body. Amazing. I'm, well, I, I really hope that, you know, this podcast, this interview today goes a little bit, contributes a little bit to, to spreading the word on that, because I think that you're right that, you know, we went from having a very traditional, and I think, you know, Singleton's efforts were trying to, you know, rail against kind of the, the blind adherence to the idea of tradition in a certain way. So I, I sort of, I got the spirit of it, but in, but in turn, I think you're right that it's caused a complete sea change against the tradition in a, in a in a way that is equally kind of blind, and so I think it's incredible that you're doing this work and 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 um, and uncovering all of this uh, all of these source texts that really are um, going to really transform people's awareness. And and not only you know you're mentioning lists, but uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but in a recent Facebook post, it's not just even uh, uh, text, but also images of the poses. Am I right? Oh, well, yeah, I, I've been working with a couple of manuscripts from Nepal, one of which is published in uh, in Gudrun Bunaman's great work on the history of the 84 asanas, um, which is somewhat sound. She certainly did a great job sharing with us uh, uh, the history of asanas represented in art in the last few hundred years. So she gives us a, lot, a whole bunch of images from manuscripts and paintings. One of them is a manuscript without a text that appears to be giving 84 poses in which all male siddhas or masters are engaging. So I've copied and scanned some of those in my Facebook posts, but I've also been using a sister text which appears to be or which is an unfinished version of that same uh, set of 84 poses. So that's what you've been seeing in my posts. Those are texts that are certainly uh, or to say the artwork is certainly relatively modern, a couple mm -hmm. centuries old okay. at top, but represents a much more archaic tradition. Yeah, wow. Wow. Well, this has been such an amazing and deep and rich discussion. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing so much of your knowledge about this tradition. I just have a couple more questions um, before we wrap up. One of them is just, you know, a, a business one. You know, where can people find you? Where can people learn about your work? You have, I can definitely, um, you know, testify to the, 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 the courses that you have um, uh, re uh, launched on your website, which are totally fascinating. That was really how I uh, found your work was was through my own um, research into this tradition and, and finding the work of Christopher Wallace, and then and then also you and and your courses are just so illuminating and interesting. So, um, can you share with us your website? If you have a couple websites and and maybe some things going on that are coming up that people might be uh, 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 able to attend. 
Yes, I'd like to uh, first make a disclaimer, and then I'll answer that directly. Um, I've been getting not a lot of criticism, mainly excitement and perhaps praise that's a little bit displaced on what I've been sharing already with my research, for, particularly on asana vinyasa, sorry, namaskar. But my disclaimer is this. Don't take me at my word. I'm actually, you know, doing this on purpose. I'm about to publish, as I say, the first will be the article on Surya Namaskara, uh, the integrity, roots, and presence of it in the original tantras, contrary to those two books we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I haven't provided the evidence publicly. I have provided the evidence in my online class. So I refer students uh, to that. It's available on Samudra Global Online, which is Yo uh, Shiva Ray's online school. We've recorded, I think, five sessions in which so far we've gone through the preliminary practices to set up the Surya Namaskar and the daily ritual, as mentioned earlier mm. in the interview. So there I do get my sources. And the next phase, which we're about to announce, part two, is actually the, the vinyasa practice, the variations of the poses in Surya Namaskar from source text. Now, when I say that, the disclaimer is if you take my course, sure, you'll get to see them. Um, you'll get to see the evidence. But what I mean by disclaimer in a broader sense is if you're out there and just listening to this, don't take my word for it. This is I don't want anyone to take the word of uh, the scholars that are writing these other books who dismiss all of Krishnamacharya's sources. I mean – I mean, that to me eliminates so much credit to the thesis uh, right off the bat that those haven't even been looked at. So I'm going to begin by publishing publicly, meaning you don't have to take my course, uh, the evidence in all these texts. The first will be the Surya Namaskar article, and then we'll take it from there. And throughout the year, articles will be coming out. The second one is going to debunk the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. I'm very happy to say. I've now uh, discovered, I think, I want to say 95% to be conservative, but perhaps it is 100% of all the practices allegedly sort of um, innovated or at least presented in a way that's authoritative in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika in source tantras dating back to the 5th century, 5th, 6th century AD. Wow. So we need to debunk that text because it has no vinyasa. It has distorted several practices, and it's gotten far too much credit as some kind of mother book or yeah. go-to book on Hatha Yoga. It is not. It is completely a collaboration that has no originality at all to itself except a couple of distortions. Wow, wow. That's amazing. I look forward to seeing that. And thank you for that. What I sort of heard is almost a call to scholarship. So, uh, yeah, and, don't trust me until I, you see the evidence. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd be a fool to say all this and be making it up. Um, you know, I'd get castigated for that. But I'm doing all of this and speaking with you as a preliminary to what's about to come out, to get people excited about it and to get people questioning what's been told to them already. Yeah, yeah. And there really is a lot of work to do. I, I remember in Christopher Wallace's book, he, he talks about how, you know, if you have any scholarly bend whatsoever in this direction, there's a lot, a lot of work. And and oh, yeah. and, and the scholarship is, is really just beginning. It's definitely not a saturated uh, area of scholarship in, in any sense. So so thank you for, you know, encouraging people to, to, to deepen their studies. I think um, the best from the start, sorry to interrupt you, I just want a quick carrot there is um, I want to recommend Christopher Harish Wallace's Tantra Illuminated, which is, in my opinion, by far the most accessible, thorough, and accurate book on the Tantra tradition available today, yeah. Tantra Illuminated. I love that book. I absolutely love that book. Yes, and it's the I think actually that's how I heard about you, actually, I think, because he mentions uh, scholars in the back of his book that focus on this, and I think that's how I first found you, actually been there quite a bit. We had a field day with the book, yeah. Yeah, it was, it's amazing. Um, so actually, that's a, a perfect segue into my last question, which is is basically, I, I have this, one of the resources on the website is called, I call it the Embodied Philosopher's Library, and it's um, essentially a, a really long annotated bibliography of a bunch of different um, yoga and wisdom texts that I wish I had had when I first started exploring the philosophy of, of these traditions. I know the feeling. <laughs> I know. So I always ask people I interview if they would maybe share. So you've shared that one, and that one's actually already on there. But if you would share maybe one or two other texts that you think would be, you know, based on our discussion, would be really fascinating. Um, it doesn't have to be an introductory text, but something that was really going to deepen their understanding of all the things we've talked about. 
It depends on, uh, I, I mean, I can't say that there's one text that covers the full breadth of topics we talked about, yeah. Jacob, because they were pretty diverse. I mean, we were talking chakras and asanas. And, um, you know, I would say I, I have to default, not to avoid the question, but I have to default to Chris Wallace for the moment. Not that, I mean, it's the best book that's ever been written that gives an overview. So you're going to find a little of everything we've discussed in that book. Mm-hmm. But in terms of taking those topics deeper, I would I think it's a great place to start to read uh, Gudrun Bunemann's 84 Asanas in Yoga with the caveat that she falls victim to the consensus without looking at the source text, apparently, which is unlike her, uh, of saying that Surya Namaskara in terms of, let's say, the Bihar school version of 12 poses, a sort of classical Surya Namaskara, uh, doesn't exist in source text when it absolutely does. In fact, overwhelmingly in source tantras, as I'm about to publish. So, you know, it's hard for me to recommend books because there's always going to be a caveat of, yeah, sure. you know, there's a grain of salt with each, but her work is excellent. Um, I think, it, you know, in terms of yoga philosophy, there's some great books on Kashmir Shaivism. The best articles or references you could have uh, that, that exist on tantra, in my opinion, uh, are written by the Oxford scholar, Professor Alexis Sanderson, who is untouchable as the top scholar in the world, um, in my opinion. But his work is going to be more academic, so not all listeners or readers will be attracted to that. Those who really want to know the roots and the sources, that's your go-to. Okay, great. All right, I'll put those in the show notes for for the listeners. And And his website. I maybe too, alexisanderson.com, I believe. I'm going to have to double check. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I can, I can put that in there. I'll look it up too. Um, and then I, I, I think we, I, we went to the, you know, about, through the about you question without mentioning your website, at least the one that I know of you, which is yeah. shivayoga.com. S-H. Yeah, S-H, right. S-H-A-I-V-A. Shiva Yoga, one word. Right, great. And then is there any other, um, are there any retreats or workshops coming up that if somebody's in your area, they could attend? Well, as a matter of fact, um, two major announcements. One is, uh, as fate would have it, I'm going to announce today. Very proud of this class. It's going to be an online course, an introduction to yoga philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism. We're going to cover it in eight weeks. Uh, this is a course for beginners. Uh, the legendary Kashmir Shaiva work, the Shiva Sutras, or the aphorisms of Shiva, with the illuminating, accessible, life-enhancing commentary of one of the greatest tantric sages ever, named Sri Kshemaraja. So this kind of course has never been done, and if you're into spanda or into non-dual philosophy or into how to apply these yogic teachings, basically on how you create, how one creates their own suffering and how to dissolve it in a life-affirming practice, this course is for you, and we're going to announce it today uh, or tomorrow, and that begins online, I think, on February 15th. It'll be Monday nights for about eight weeks or nine weeks, and if you live in the Bay Area, we're also going to be announcing courses on Kashmir Shaivism and other topics um, that will be in person at Yoga Kula. Thirdly and lastly, uh, part two of the course I'm doing with Shiva Ray I mentioned through Samudra Global Online, although the details are only currently now on my site. Part two of the Asana Vinyasa online course, which is the uh, Vinyasa Sadhana, the daily practice of sequencing the poses of Surya Namaskara, which is not supposed to have existed before 1928. I will show that it is all over the place in the Tantras and give people the first look, I believe, in modernity of what Surya Namaskar looked like in terms of the postural sequence. Wow. Wow, you have a lot of great offerings going on. In fact, I want to take that Shiva Sutras course with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into um, that. I'd be greatly honored. And um, uh, it is definitely one of a kind. And I don't mean, you know, the fact that I'm teaching it, but rather it's based on uh, seven manuscripts that I personally recovered from Kashmir in 2012. A couple of them recovered by a colleague of mine last year. In other words, we're drawing right out of the source manuscripts from a culture that has been oppressed for centuries. Wow. 
Amazing. Well, that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much, Christopher, for uh, speaking with me and and sharing all of this incredible knowledge and all of these interesting and fascinating uh, discoveries that you've found through your research. I think it's going to be really interesting for people to to hear this. So thank you so much. And thank you. Um, When we're off the the record, I'll ask you one last question. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thanks. uh, Thanks, Christopher. I'll, I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Well, everybody, that was our interview with Christopher Tompkins. I hope you enjoyed the interview. If you want to learn more about Christopher Tompkins and his online courses and goings-on, you can check out his website that he mentioned there, shivayoga.com, S-H-A-I-V-A, yoga.com. He also has several courses that you can check out. I put a couple of websites in the show notes to help you uh, navigate to Christopher's goings-on. Also, if you are enjoying these podcasts, we'd very much appreciate it if you would leave us a review on iTunes. It just takes a moment, and it really helps to push these podcasts into other people's eyes so that other people can really gain from these teachings as well of these incredible teachers that we're interviewing here at Chitheads. Also, if you're new to Embodied Philosophy, check out embodiedphilosophy.com. So until next time, friends, namaste.